Good morning and welcome to Business Morning on Channels Television. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. Thank you for joining us. Well, let's uh, begin the show from the global oil market as some um, prices fell this morning, bearing gains from the previous session as persistent demand concerns due to the coronavirus pandemic outweighed hopes for a new U.S. stimulus package. More than one million people have died of COVID-19 as of Tuesday with fertilities and infectious surging in several countries. U.S. West Texas in intermediate uh, crude futures dropped 22 cents to $40.38. The more active Brent crude futures for December fell 19 cents to $42.68 a barrel. The November contract, which expires on Wednesday, fell 17 cents to $42.26 per barrel. Commodities markets crept up earlier in the day as Democratic lawmakers unveiled a new $2.2 trillion coronavirus relief bill, which a U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi says was a compromise measure. Brent and WTI in August hit their highest level since early March on optimism over rising fuel demand and major oil producers' strong compliance with promised supply cuts. Since then, though, they have dropped about $3 on demand worries. And back here, agriculture as an indigenous occupation in Nigeria has gone through various phases of development. This development is an effect of government policies and state approach to agriculture, which either demeans or heightens the impact of the sector in the nation. The sector in the 1960s contributed 85% of the Nigeria foreign exchange earnings, 90% of employment generation, and about 80% to gross domestic product. Available data also confirms that at independence in 1960, the contribution of agriculture to the GDP was about 60%, which is typical for developing agrarian nations until the oil boom. Although Nigeria today depends heavily on oil industry for its revenue, it is still predominantly an agricultural society. However, the latest GDP data shows the sector contributed just 24.55% to uh, ag aggregate real GDP in the second quarter of this year. And as Nigeria marks its 60 years of independence, many believe it's time to go back to the drawing board to bring back the sector to its past glory. I'm being joined by the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Best Foods Global Limited, Mr. Emmanuel Ijewere. Thank you very much, Mr. Ijewere, for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, good morning. Now, agriculture used to be the mainstay of the Nigerian economy from independence till the 70s. Where did we miss it? Uh, we, miss, we missed it because we misunderstood the gift of God to us. The gift of God that we suddenly discovered was oil. But it was not meant to destroy us. It was meant to build us and become one of the top countries in the world. That is where we missed it. Our own mindset. If you look at it historically, like you rightly pointed out, in 1960, it, it, it account, agriculture accounted for 60% of our GDP. Then oil came in 1959, and we now had a coup. After the coup in 1966, it now became a situation where all the plans that the three West, the three regional governments have put in place were thrown to the bath, into the dustbin. And the new people who are now in charge of Nigeria's economy, the military, had a different mindset. And they would have not confronted with so much money in their hands that the structure of Nigeria's future was no longer as important. It's about money today. And agriculture now was kept in the background while so much was being spent um, from the foreign exchange importing goods into Nigeria. This created a situation where many of our young people who would have taken over from their fathers and their grandfathers left the various villages where agriculture was practiced and went to the cities. This situation continues to deteriorate until we got to some, after this, we had a civil war, which was disastrous. After the civil war, we now had a situation where the military tried to do what they could, the civilian government tried to do what they could, but the mindset was still wrong. There was no long-term plan, there was no long-term structure, there was no deliberate belief that agriculture was Nigeria's economic future until we got about some few years ago when we had a gentleman called uh, uh, Dr. Kim Adishino, 
he came, his first job was to change Nigeria's mindset. First and foremost, he said, agriculture is a business. Yes, See, if we had done come up with that kind of idea in the 60s, Nigeria today would be one of the first world countries because we started off as a fantastic country economically and, and, and agriculture. That's where we got it wrong. The mindset was wrong and the corruption itself had its own great, great toll. And still having it till today. That's where we got it wrong. Now, you are an accountant turned to farmer. Why is agriculture still at a rudimentary level dominated by peas and farmers 60 years after independence? All right, I will answer for it from the time I came into agriculture in the year 2000. So I would say that the past, I can account for the past 20 years, not 60 years, but I was a young boy 60 years ago. <laughs> now, so for my own period, what I have seen is that, is what I just narrated to you, that mm. in the past 20 years, what's happened is that you've had all kinds of interventions, mm. but the interventions meant well, but corruption took over. Because the people they were intervening to assist, that is the farmers, were old people, uneducated people, hardworking people, and therefore the civil servants took advantage of all those monies. Nobody saw anything that came out of it. A lot of interventions. But that is that is that was the, those are some of the things that were responsible. I think as far back as 10 years ago or 12 years ago, government recognized the fact that agriculture was Nigeria's future. The oil volatility is a great disadvantage to us. And I hear now, it, when you, you said earlier that the oil price raised for the $2 uh, dollars per barrel, that I, I, I think that makes me very sad because I would have preferred oil to be just $4 per barrel. Then we can come back to our senses. Mm. Yeah, now, of course, you did mention uh, that various governments, of course, have been uh, talking about diversifying this term around, perhaps having realized the fact yes. that uh, we can't just... Um, depend on oil. Uh, how would you describe the responses of respective administrations since independence uh, towards the growth of this um, sector and how successful have they been? I mean, government uh, have introduced several intervention funds to support the sector in the past. We have agri funds and so on. And we will be talking about anchor borrowers uh, you know, by the present administration, what has been the experience of agriculturalists like you with these funds? Now, uh, the past six or seven years has been one of great hope. Uh, like I said, from the time of Dr. Adeshino, a number of people, educated people, we are beginning to now re reconsider going to agriculture as a profession. It's taking a, a, a long time, but it's happening, and there's a lot of undercurrent going on. Unfortunately, one of the sectors of the economy that will have helped drive this, which is the banking industry, mm. failed the agricultural industry. They kept on telling everybody that agriculture was a very risky business. Oil was the best place to go. Well, in actual fact, for a particular bank, one of the top first generation banks, for 15 years kept in its report every year that agriculture was the best performing sector in their own bank uh, annual reports. So nobody spoke for agriculture. Nobody, because they were all checkered. And, but what has happened lately is that this central bank stepped in through the commercial agricultural scheme and the uh, anchor borrower scheme. They seem to have now created a new revolution coming on now. All we need to do is to say to the central bank, discuss a lot more with the private sector. A number of well-educated people are coming in. Our older generation who sustain this country at the expense of themselves because they remain poor, but they worked so hard to feed us. Nigeria has not suffered food shortage in terms of creating starvation and so on because of these people. And I think they're the greatest heroes we have in Nigeria. These various farmers in the various villages who wake up very early in the morning. Mm. They should not be forgotten in these 60 years. They have sustained us as a country. They have given their lives up. They have remained in abject poverty and have created continued day in, day out to go to their farms and send food out. 
And when it gets to the people in the city, the next thing they price it. And they say, ah, it's too expensive. But they don't know how much sweat has gone into it. So mm. I believe that those people should be honored in these 60 years. Having, having said that, I want to come back and say that things are now beginning to change. The central bank intervention showed a lot of in-depth thinking. Before now, or before 10, 10 years ago, a number of uh, decisions were taken by government from the basis of supply. But with the new thinking in agriculture, it must be demand-based. The supply-based economy will not help. Produce things that you are not sure whether that's what people want to buy. It does not make sense. So let those who want the goods determine what kind of goods they want and what quantity they want. Those are the things that are changing now. And these are helping the mindset. And more and more industries will come once they are able to get into this. Then you now have challenges in terms of, of, of uh, the post-harvest losses. Nigeria is one of the countries in the world with the highest level of post-harvest losses. Those are is very bad and shameful. They have, and as of today, Nigeria in, uh, in um, Africa is one of the least refrigerated countries uh, in Africa, not to mention the world. I, I'll just give an example. India, for example, has a total of uh, 30, about 30 uh, million cubic meters of refrigerated space. Nigeria, as of today, has not, I don't think we've, ex we've exceeded 120,000 uh, cubic meters. South Africa is three times the size of Nigeria in terms of uh, refrigeration. So refrigeration is one area because that's part of the value chain. Mm. Like a doctor traditional said, agriculture is not just farming alone. Agriculture is the entire value chain. Mm. And you need to get it right at every stage. Not enough to produce. You must be able to uptake. You must be able to preserve them. You must be able to help harvest them in a manner that will not destroy them. Those are the things that are challenges that we are facing now. And mm -hmm. I think, but I'm hoping, I'm beginning to see that the banks are now beginning to take a cue. And they are setting up very serious uh, agricultural desks in their various banks now. And thank God, like I said, I'm so sad when you said to me just now that the petrol price, the, uh, the world price has gone to $42. I'm very sad. I'm sorry uh, to say that. I'm very sad. I wish I continue to go down to $4. <laughs> All right. Well, some people wouldn't think so, uh, uh, Mr. Ijewere. Anyway, you talked about uh, value chain. Right. Talk to us about the linkages between industry and agriculture within the context of backward integration. Have we achieved much? We, we, have, we have not achieved much. No, no, certainly not. But we are beginning to get to that stage now. What has happened is that because of lack of um, serious interest in agriculture. A number of industries that were set up long ago um, during the colonial times to use up our own raw materials are no longer being serviced, are not, are not getting enough of such raw materials for their various factories, and their businesses are growing. So the, many of them have now resorted to importing those goods, like palm oil from abroad. We are importing all those things from abroad. We are importing maize on, on all of these. But Something has happened recently, and uh, a number of things happened. Last, late last year, the federal government closed its borders, and everybody thought Nigeria would collapse in terms of food. Nigeria did not collapse. Mm. Then COVID came. Everybody thought that was the end, that Nigeria did not collapse. Before COVID came, the central bank had removed a number of items from the list of those that can have access to mm. foreign exchange. They felt a number of people protested Nigeria would not collapse. Now, it's beginning to dawn on us that we are capable of improving what we have if only our minds are collectively directed towards it. It's beginning to happen. And I just hope that the borders will remain closed for now to enable us to get to our potentials. What's also very exciting is that Nigeria will now be, will be signing into the Af African um, Free Trade Zone Agreement. Once that is done, Nigerian borders will be open. So we need to prepare ourselves. Nigerians have always been champions. Everywhere we go, every industry we are involved in, we are, 
we always find ourselves to be champions in Africa. Agriculture should not be different. So uh, a number of Nigerians, unfortunately, have heard in recent times since these African tree trade came up, have gone to places like Gabon and a number of other countries where there is ease of doing business. Mm. Government must try to create an ease of doing business. You want to have land for you to plant your crops. You, what you have to go through with government. You had the story of the Songhai. Songhai, the, 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 the Reverend Father who wanted it, who started it, wanted to do it in Nigeria, could not find land. So he went across the border. Now we're all going there now to trade. So government must now get its mind, especially state governments, must mm. now start competing for people mm. to come to their places to develop the agriculture. Please, the sustainable source of Nigeria's growth is not oil. In fact, the world itself is beginning now to say, Look, let's move out of fossil fuel. Many of them are going into alternatives. So what I'm actually pleading for is that we, re we, we, we recondition our minds. The, great, the future is great. God has been kind to Nigeria. The land is good. The people are hardworking. Do it in the right direction, and I assure you, Nigeria will not have any problem. Now, I, I remember in, in those days, well, I, I wasn't there, but history told us that in those days when, uh, you know, we had the regional government, every region generated its own income through their cash crops, like we have yeah. in Southwest, where we have cocoa. Can we yeah. ever have a situation like that where state governments could, you know, generate their revenue through their major cash crops without depending on revenue allocation? I mean, going forward, Nigeria is celebrating 60 years. What happens, you know, after now? Uh, I'm sorry for being so uh, dramatic. I would suggest that all the governors, all the 36 governors, should all be taken to a hall where a psychiatrist will talk to them about where Nigeria should be going. And the, every effort should be done towards that direction because that's what will provide jobs for their people or for our people. That's where jobs, that's where the, few, the, the industries can thrive. So until we are able to do that, I don't think we can really, because agriculture is not done in Tinubu Square or in Oba Square in Benin. It's done in the various villages. And what is the work of the local governments? How geared in are they? The local governments are under the state governors. How are they being used? So we must, we must really be granular. We must, we, we must really dig deep to get this thing done. We have a chance. We have a great opportunity now. But our local government chairmen and their councillors, the governors and their cabinets, the federal executive council, the president and all others must believe in it. Not a, they, they must move away from the fact that now when they devote money to agriculture, they make a lot of noise on pages of newspaper and on television, and the money ends up in individual pockets. That's now changing because the people who are now in the agricultural space are getting better educated, better, getting better informed. So they need to retain their own minds. And the other one I quickly want to bring up is the research institutions. Mm. A research institution that only researches for itself or researches to give to the minister or researches to give to the uh, commissioner or governor. Governor is not a farmer. The minister is not a farmer. If you research and your research does not add something to the improvement of the lives of the people is a wasted money. So mm. we need to also bring the research institutions together under one umbrella. Let yeah. them work together to grow agriculture. All right. And Brazil did it, and it's so fantastic. Those All are right. issues that we need to really look at. All right, uh, Mr. Ijewere, let's just hope uh, we get it right going forward. Thank you very much for your time on the show. Mr. Emmanuel Ijewere is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Best Foods Global Limited. Thank you for your time.